folks, Nick here. Did you ever want to be a knight of Arthurian legend? Of course you didn't. People were smelly back then, and they had all kinds of diseases, and nobody kept their body hair under control, and the bathroom situation, don't get me started. But let's imagine that you actually did want to be a knight of Arthurian legend. This might be the game for you. Today we're taking a look at Shadows Over Camelot. This is from Serge Lambert and Bruno Cathala, and published by Days of Wonder, who are the uh, publishers of Small World, which is a review that I did, and a game that I like a lot. So in this game, everyone takes on the role of one of the famous knights of myth and legend and maybe reality, King Arthur, Sir Galahad, and so on and so forth. And you're trying to defend Camelot against the encroaching forces of Mordred and all of his evil minions. You've got Saxons on one side, Picts on the other. You've got the Black Knight humiliating all of your fellow knights in a tournament. You've got all kinds of siege engines being put out. You've got the Excalibur falling into darkness. You've got Lancelot being a total douche and running off with his magical armor. And I don't even remember that from the legend, but whatever. And you have to stop it. You all have to work together cooperatively to put an end to all this evil nonsense. But one of you may not be all that he or she seems to be. Well, in-game it's he because apparently no knight could ever have been a woman ever, which is kind of genderist or sexist but hey what are you gonna do so <laughs> let's go ahead and take a look at the game and then we're gonna come back and i'll let you know what i think about it now every player in shadows over camelot is a brave knight of camelot uh, including the famous king arthur and all of his loyal vassals and Basically, you are trying to stave evil off from destroying Camelot as best you can. Now, you're going to win the game by going on heroic quests and filling that round table with these white swords. There are 12 spaces on that round table, and if the entire table is filled and the majority, at least seven of those swords, are white, congratulations, the brave knights have won the game. However, when quests fail and when certain other things happen, which I'll get into later, it's going to actually put black swords on the table. If at any point during the game six swords, six black swords are on that table, the knights have lost and Camelot has fallen to evil. The reason for that is that in this game, ties always go to evil because brave knights will settle for no less than an overwhelming victory. Now, how are you actually going to win this game and put white swords on that table? And how is it possible that black swords are going to get there? That has to do with quests. There are all kinds of different quests spread out all over the map. Each different tile and section has to do with a different quest. Now, the knights start off in Camelot at the round table, and there's actually a couple things you can do there. The specific quest in uh, question there is actually defeating the siege engines. Now, certain things are going to put these little siege engines out on the board. And that's actually another way that the knights could lose. If there are ever 12 siege engines out there, the knights automatically lose without question. If a knight is at the round table, however, they have a shot to destroy these siege engines. Now, they could also go to the Black Knight quest. The Black Knight is there, he's a minion of evil, and he's trying to humiliate your knights. One knight, and only one knight, could go and attempt that quest. But once they're there, they're committed, and if they ever leave before the quest is finished, then all their progress is lost, but not the Black Knight's progress. They could also go and try to fight the Saxons or the Picts, which are going to be represented by these different little miniatures. And basically, you're go going there trying to fend them off. As many knights as you want could go on that quest, and you're trying to, if the this board ever fills up with four Saxons, or on the other side, four Picts, the knights will, uh, that quest will fail, and instead of putting out a white sword, you're going to put out a black sword and some siege engines, which are really bad. Then there's the Holy Grail quest. Now, on this quest, again, as many knights as possible can contribute. You're trying to put out positive grail cards in order to actually acquire the Holy Grail, which is not only going to put a lot of white swords on the round table, but it's also going to give you the Holy Grail to use as you see fit, which will it will actually bring a character back to life. There's also the Excalibur quest. Again, as many knights as you want can go here. Uh, throughout the game, Excalibur is going to be slipping farther and farther along this track into darkness. If it ever gets all the way to the other side, the knights have lost Excalibur forever, and they're going to put black swords on the table. But if they can bring it back over to the good side, they will put white swords on the table and actually acquire Excalibur, which is going to be really helpful for winning battles and possibly destroying a black card. 
Then we have the Lancelot quest. Now, Lancelot has gone rogue. He is kind of turning into a bad guy. And one knight and one knight only, much like the Black Knight quest, can go here and try to face him in single combat. And again, if you leave before the quest is over, you're going to lose all of your progress. But if you successfully beat Lancelot there, you're going to be able to grab Lancelot's armor, which is really cool and helpful for trying to stave off evil through the black deck of cards. And actually, then this board is going to flip over to the dragon side because you have to finish Lancelot's original quest, which was defeating this dragon. And now a many knights could go here at the same time because it is a much more difficult quest defeating that dragon no cool artifact for winning this quest but you'll get some white swords on the table and keep black swords from being put out as well first there's a little setup at the beginning of the game each character is going to get one of these knight cards representing the knight that they're representing you can do it randomly you can do it by choice however you want to do it they're going to take the appropriate character card and they're going to get a mini representing them which they're going to put at the round table they're also going to get a different colored die, which they're going to put on their character card, and they're going to—it's a six-sided, normal six-sided die. You're never going to roll it though, but you'll use it to keep track of your life points. You're going to start with four. You'll put it on this little field here, and your life points can go up to a max of six, and you could also lose all of them and die. Now. All the knights have two different phases on their turn of different actions that they both must take and that they could take. And all of those are going to be detailed on this card. Basically, most of the information here is just static stuff that all the knights have access to. Uh, these here are just little cheat sheets about what each of the uh, objects do, like Excalibur adds plus one to combat, and you can uh, discard it to counter a black card. The Holy Grail will bring a knight back to life as soon as they die, and Lancelot's armor will let you basically uh, sift through the black deck before you draw a card. But down here it details what you can actually do on your turn. So first is the progression of evil. There's this black deck of cards here, which is, every one of them is bad. Drawing one is always going to do something bad to the knights. It's just a matter of how bad it is and are you willing to risk it. Uh, so you might have to draw one of those black cards. Uh, just to give you an indication of what some of them do, a lot of them are basically have to do directly with some of the quests. Now, for example, the Excalibur card is going to move Excalibur one step closer to defeat. Which So when this card is drawn from the deck, you're going to take Excalibur's miniature, which should be in the center here at the beginning, and move it one step closer to the bad side of the track. Uh, you also have the... Saxon and Picked cards, like this Mercenary card, which are going to make you add either a Saxon miniature or a Picked miniature on one side of the battlefield. And there are some that are specific to either faction. So that's bad. Like I said, if four of those go out, that quest fails. And those quests will actually reset. The only quests that don't that does not reset are the Excalibur, Holy Grail, and Lancelot quests. And there's also some bad ones for the Holy Grail. Uh, for instance, this special card, Desolation, which is going to make you discard a Grail card, which is one of the things you need to complete the quest, and uh, put this in an empty spot, basically blocking off one of the spots for completing the Grail quest. Uh, you have these combat cards for the Black Knight and either Lancelot or the Dragon, depending on which side of the board you're on. These cards are going to add a combat value to the... Uh, the particular quest that you're on for the bad guys. Now, when you draw one of these cards, you have the option of putting it face down on the slot where it's supposed to go. You don't have to do that. Sometimes it's helpful to let people know what particular stat that they're fighting. But if you choose to play it face down, you're gonna to get to draw a white card, which is always beneficial. And that's a very good thing, but that's the choice you have to make. And there's other special cards like Morgan, which is going to make a knight immediately lose two life points, or each knight discards a white card. And there's different versions of her. They all do bad things. You've got the Dark Forest, which also affects the Grail. No further Grail card may be placed until a quest is victoriously completed. You've got the Mists of Avalon, which is from now on, each lost quest adds an additional black sword to the round table, and so on and so forth. Every black card is bad in one shape or another. It's just a matter of how bad. But you don't have to draw a black card in your turn. Uh, for your progression of evil step, you could instead go ahead and put a siege engine out. But, like I said before, if there are 12 siege engines on that board, the knights automatically lose. So that sounds really bad to do that, but at the beginning of the game, when there are not too many of them out there, maybe you just want to leave them out. But remember that those are very hard to destroy. 
And the last thing you can do is sacrifice a life point. Now, sacrificing life points can be very, very dangerous because you don't have many life points. But if you do have a full allotment of life points, maybe it's a better thing to do depending on the situation of the game. But that's only the bad things you can do. What about the good things? Well, on the knight's turn, you have one single action. Yes, you have a number of different things you need to do, but you've only got one action to do it in. And those are all detailed down here. So the first thing you can do is move to a new quest, which is basically just take your miniature and go to any other quest if it's available. If it's uh, one of the Lancelot or Black Knight quests, then those are only one knight. If someone's already there, you can't do it. But otherwise, there's no restriction. You can doesn't the distance doesn't matter. You can go from one quest to another. Now you could also choose to perform a quest heroic action. Now that heroic action is different depending on what quest you're at. If you're at uh, Camelot. You could either draw a card from the white deck, which are really good cards uh, that are going to be beneficial, or you could choose to fight a siege engine. Now let's go over what the white cards do. First off, every player is going to start with one of these Merlin cards. Merlin is a very powerful card and there's others of him in the deck, but basically you can use him to either remove a siege engine or cancel a standard black card played on any quest, the last one played, or three people can sacrifice their Merlin card simultaneously to... Uh, cancel a special black card that's drawn from the black deck. But the other types of cards that you could draw from that deck are, first there's fight cards, and these go from numbers 1 to 5 up here in the top. And these are the primary ways you're going to solve most quests. And how these get used depends on the quest. So, for example, if you were on the, well, let's go back to the Camelot example. If you're trying to fight a siege engine, you're going to play as many of these cards as you want face down. Doesn't matter what the numbers are, you can play as many as you want. And basically you're trying to defeat a siege engine. Uh, and you're gonna roll this die. Whatever number that is, is the siege engine's attack value. All those cards that you played face down have to at least have to beat that number. Ties do not work for you. If you beat that number, you get to remove a siege engine and your cards get discarded. If you don't beat that number, guess what? Not only is that siege engine not destroyed, but you're gonna lose a life point. So that's really bad. So that's what you can do at Camelot. And like I said, you can also use your action to draw a card there. If you go to the Saxon or Picked quest, you're going to try to play one of your fight cards, and you're going to have to make a set through of one through five. You have to be played in order. So if no one's played the one card yet, you must play the one. And then whoever plays the next card must place down a two. Once you place your number five down, you're going to automatically complete that quest. Everyone's The white sword gets put on the table. All the knights that were there get sent back to Camelot. They get to draw four cards and disperse them amongst themselves, and everyone gets a life point. Huzzah! The picked quest is the same way. If you're going for the Black Knight quest, you're trying to make two pairs of any numbers. So, you could do uh, two ones, two twos, however you want to do it. But they have it doesn't matter what order you do it in, as long as it's two pairs of identical numbers by the end. And remember what I said, though. Only a single knight can be there, and if that knight leaves before the quest is completed, all of his progress is wiped out, his white cards get discarded. The black knight is going to keep putting black cards out there. Whichever side fills up first, the black knight cards or the knight cards, is the quest is going to end. You're going to compare the values of all the cards. Whoever has the highest numbers on either side is going to be the winner. Again, ties go to evil. And once you complete that, you'll get white swords, cards, and get life points back and go back to Camelot. And then that quest, along with the Saxon and Picks quest, will reset and they can be completed or failed again. Now, the Excalibur quest is a little bit different in that you're not going to be playing combat cards. Instead, you're going to be discarding any card from your hands. If you discard a card from your hands, which you, you do one card per heroic action you spend, you're going to move it one step closer to the good side. If it ever gets all the way over to this side, not only do we put white swords on the table and get cards and life points, you're actually going to take Excalibur, which can help you out in combat. Now, Lancelot, going back to the combat cards, he's going to need a set of three cards of the same number and then a set of two cards of the same number. So a little bit more difficult than the Black Knight quest, but the premise is the same. Whichever side fills up first is going to end the quest. Everyone compares their numbers on both sides. Whoever has the higher number is the winner. Uh, ties go to evil. They're going to get Lancelot's armor along with all that other good stuff. And then this board flips over to the dragon side, which also works the same way except that you need three 
triplicate pairs of cards, not pairs of cards, but you need three of one number, three of another number, three of yet another number, and then whatever side fills up first, you're gonna have to compare and hope that you get the best. Luckily, this lets multiple people be here and there's no chance of your quest progress being reset. Finally, the Grail Quest. Now the Grail Quest is gonna require that you place these special white cards. Actually, they're called standard white cards, but these Grail cards. You'll be here, you'll spend your heroic action to put a Grail card starting on the light side, and your, your goal is to fill up this entire track with a one of these Grail cards on every single spot. If you can do that, you get the Holy Grail, which will save someone from death, three white swords, which is pretty awesome, and the other standard rewards. However, evil is gonna to try to trip you up at every turn, because there are these despair cards which can come out and which will fill up slots starting from over here, yada, 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 and keep encroaching on your turf. If this entire board fills up with these cards, that quest is lost and a lot of bad stuff happens. Three black swords get put on the table, which is hugely bad. Uh, and in fact, it's so bad that one, you need to spend a grail card just to wipe out one of those cards. And you don't even get to put that grail card in that spot. You have to spend another grail card to fill up that spot. So that can be a really tough quest to complete. But basically, that's the crux of the game, is that you're going to keep trying to complete these quests. Uh, hopefully, before more Black Swords get put on the table, you're going to have to make that tough call between putting out Siege Engines, drawing really bad back card, black cards, or losing more life. Now, fortunately, there are other special white cards that can help you, like Heroism, uh, which you can place on the quest of your choice, which will add an extra sword of whichever type, whether the quest succeeds or fails. Convocation will bring all knights back to Camelot and let them draw cards. Clairvoyance lets you sort through the cards on the top of the black deck and arrange them however you want. Uh, reinforcements lets you draw white cards or let all the other knights draw white cards, which is pretty cool. Lady of the Lake will move uh, Excalibur further towards your side and so on and so forth. And you're going to keep going like this until you fill up the white table for better or for worse. Now, I should also mention that each player also has a special power on their knight card. Sir Percival, uh, during the progression of evil, can peek at the top black card before deciding whether to draw it or not. Sir Galahad uh, can play a special white card for free uh, each turn. It doesn't take an action. King Arthur can trade cards, and King Arthur also always goes first. There's uh, Playing a special white card is another type of action that you can do as well. Uh, you can discard three identical cards to gain a life point. And, well, let's save that last thing for last. Uh, you could also uh, choose to take a second hero heroic action on your turn if you're willing to sacrifice a life point. Now, even if you do that, you can't do the same heroic action twice. So if you're on a quest, you can't play two quest cards one after the other. But if you were on a quest, you could play a special card and then take your quest heroic action. You can move and then take a quest action, however you want to do it, but it will cost you a life point and you can't double up. Now, that's basically the overview of the game. I'm sure I missed a few things. There is one very important aspect of this game, probably the central mechanic of this game, that I did not go over. I did not show you the other side of the knight character cards. That's because every knight character card on the other side looks like this, traitor. Now why would that be? At the start of the game, after everyone chooses their knights, there's one other important thing you have to do, and that's deal out loyalty cards. Now there are two types of loyalty cards. Most of them look like this. If it looks like this, what this basically says down here is that you are a loyal knight of the round table, and it tells you what your win conditions are, filling up the round table with white swords. Okay. In the basic game of Shadows Over Camelot, one of the cards in that pile is going to be this, the traitor card. One player possibly may be the traitor. And I say may be a traitor because you're always going to have more character cards than there are actual players in the game. Unused character cards go back, or unused loyalty cards, I should say, go back into the box unseen. So no one knows for sure. The chances are good that there's a traitor, but it's not guaranteed, and you don't know for sure. Now, if you're the traitor, your goal is to lay seven black swords at the round table. I'm sorry, you have to have seven black swords on the round table. Um, or surround Camelot with 12 siege engines. Basically, you want the game to win. You want there to be more black swords on the round table, and you want there to be all the siege engines out. Uh, and so you're going to be actively working against the other players trying to make that happen. You're going to do whatever you can to make those quests fail, to hold up the rest of the characters, to keep special cards out of their hands, basically working to undermine the other players. Now, 
If the other players suspect that there is a traitor amongst their, in their midst, at a certain point in the game, they can try to accuse that person. In order for that to happen, there has to be either at least six swords of any side on the round table, or six siege engines out in front of Camelot. Each player, once per game, as their heroic action for the turn, can make an accusation. They can basically stand up, shout at a character or a player, I believe you are the traitor, sir, reveal yourself. That character is immediately going to take their loyalty card, flip it up, and reveal it themselves. If they're a loyal knight, whoops, sorry, my mistake. And basically what's going to happen is one of the white swords that's on the table gets flipped over to its black side, which is really, really bad. However, if you are correct in your accusation, you're actually going to get to add a white sword to the round table, and that player must reveal themselves to the traitor, and that means that their entire rest of their game is going to change. They're going to flip their character card over to the traitor side, and they're basically out of the game as a normal knight. Instead, their game turn changes, and they do two things. First, they're going to taunt the knights. They pick a white card at random from the hand of any knight of their choice, and they discard it, which could really stimmy someone, especially if it's a single player out on one of the single quests. And then they're going to help evil spread by either adding a siege engine or drawing and playing the top card of the black deck. One other important thing is that if that knight was able to gain Lancelot's armor during the course of the game, they retain the use of Lancelot's armor <laughs> afterwards, which means they're going to get a chance to draw two cards from the black deck, play one, and then place the other underneath the black draw pile, which is really, really bad. That means they have more chances to draw something really bad for the rest of the loyal knights. Now, in addition to the benefit of being able to find out who the traitor is and putting an extra white sword on the table, if the traitor goes unfound at the end of the game, that player will immediately reveal themselves and then two of the swords on the round table, even if uh, two of the white swords get flipped over to black. So even if you think you're winning, if you were not able to discover the traitor, you might still lose the game. And that basically is Shadows Over Camelot in a nutshell. All right, so in the interest of being a fair and unbiased and objective board game video reviewer, I'm going to run through all the things that I don't like about Shadows Over Camelot and that a lot of other people don't like. In other words, the bad stuff. The game is long. Even with a minimum amount of players, which I don't recommend, by the way, and that could be considered another problem. Don't ever play this with the minimum amount of players. Uh, even five is probably too few. But even with a smaller group of players, it's still going to be a eh, at least two-hour game. And frankly, I'd be shocked by that. This is a three- to four-hour game if there's a lot of players and if you're you know not trying to just rush through it at a lightning speed. So this can be long. That can deter it from getting to the table a lot of times. Some people don't want to put that much time into a game that already has a lot of tension for you know a long extended period of time. The theme is is not as strong as I would like when compared to the mechanics. I think that the components bring out the theme quite a lot. I mean, they're wonderful components, but when you get down to it, playing the cards, it's all a little bit abstract. You're just trying to make numbered sets. And so the mechanics don't tie to the theme very well at all, in my opinion. I think that some of the character powers are unbalanced. There are clearly some knights that have better powers than the others. The ability to move from Camelot for a free action, the ability to get bonuses in fights, or you know, by being able to, or to play a card down afterwards or to get a bonus when fighting the siege engines, and the ability to use a special action card for free on your turn, those are amazing. And when you compare it to the ability to just trade a card, which powers like that could be very useful in specific circumstances and you'll be glad that you have them but overall in general they're not as powerful as the other ones so some people aren't going to want to play certain knights because they're not going to feel as useful and then finally i would say that the game is a little bit unbalanced in favor of the knights the heroes now a trader who knows what he or she is doing is going to you know mop the floor with a bunch of knights who really don't work together well that is true but if everyone knows is what they're doing and is familiar with the game, I think that the Knights have a significant edge because there's just very, very telltale signs of what a trader is going to do. And in order to be effective as a trader, there are certain actions that they need to take that are just going to be suspicious, like going after Lancelot's armor early and heavily, going to uh, the Excalibur and just... Uh, dumping special cards but staying there for an awfully long time going back and forth to make sure that the quest isn't completed all that quickly things like that 
I don't know if that made any sense, but I just think that the trader has a very hard time and eh, maybe that's it's supposed to be that way, but I know that if you're stuck as a trader and you just feel like overwhelmed, it cannot be all that great a feeling. Okay, so I thought really hard about all of those bad things and some of them were probably stretching a bit, but I wanted to be fair. Now let's go to what I like about that game, this game. And that's everything else. I love this game. This is my number two rated game of all time. And for what I think are very good reasons. Now, I mentioned before that the theme isn't that tightly connected to the mechanics. And that's true. I stand by that. But on the other hand, this is the type of game where the theme is brought out to life by the players, not necessarily the game components and the mechanics itself. This is a wonderful social game tied to a very cool board game. I love the back and forth exchanges between all the players. I love the suspicion of the trader mechanic. Oh, by the way, don't ever, ever, ever play this game without the trader mechanic. I know the rules give you the option to do that, especially if it's your first time or if you're playing with people that don't like to be that competitive. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. It just ruins this game. The game itself is okay as just a purely cooperative game, but that trader element is what you need and it's awesome. And what's even better is playing with the idea that there may not be a trader, but you don't know that. Having those extra loyalty cards and throwing one back in the box, that's just awesome. Trust me, it happens. We've had at least two games out of the like eight to 10 that we've played where someone was never the trader, but we thought they were the entire time. Someone was doing things that were just shady and dumb and suspicious. We we're like, traitor, you are absolutely the traitor. We know that you are, come on, just admit it. And he's getting red right in the face like, I'm not the traitor, I'm not the traitor. And then we get to the end of the game and we're like, all right, we think we got this, but two swords are gonna flip over because we know you're the traitor. So let's just get it over with. And nothing happens. Who's a traitor? No one's a traitor? You're kidding me. <laughs> and I just love that. Those kinds of things in this game are just awesome. I think that the, some of the mechanics, while, I, while I, again, they're not a little bit abstract as far as just playing down the numbered sets. I love the idea of the two different event cards of having the, the black cards that you uh, either have to draw or you know making that tough decision between the black deck or putting out the siege engine or losing life when Every hit point is vital in this game. And if you're not willing to sacrifice life points, you are the traitor, my friends, <laughs> most of the time. And it's, you know, I love that. Uh, the knight cards and having the special ones that could be game changing, you know, just love that. I do love having special powers for all the knights. If, if they didn't have special powers, this game would be very different and much worse. But being distinctive from each other, like I said, some of the powers are a little bit unbalanced, but nevertheless, when even if you have a power that's not quite as good as some of the others when you get a chance to use it and when it is critically helpful it's an awesome feeling so you know i love that i love <laughs> i love the components of this game this game has beautiful components beautiful artwork on the box beautiful artwork on all the tiles um the little miniatures were a really nice touch even especially for the uh, not just for the knights which kind of makes sense but for the the artifacts the holy grail excalibur because, and Lancelot's armor, because they weren't necessary, but they did it. And Days of Wonder is known for doing things like that, going that little extra mile to make the components gorgeous. And, you know, like I said, it really needs it because this, you know, even the, the theme comes from the players and from the components, not necessarily the mechanics. And, uh, so I really cannot say enough good things about Shadows Over Camelot. I love the tension in the game. I think there's a constant level of tension, whether or not there's a traitor or not, because you don't know. And uh, I, I just love that. I, it, this encapsulates the feeling that a hard co-op game should have. And that's that you need to do 10 things on your turn. But guess what? You've only got one action, maybe two. And are you willing to sacrifice that life point to get that second action? Uh, I can't say enough good things about this. It's a fantastic game. It's a little too complex to bring out for family game night. But it, on the other hand, if you could get your family to play it. Uh, well, I love anything that turns families against each other. I... I have to say. So <laughs> this is uh, Shadows Over Camelot from Days of Wonder. Uh, I am a fan and I always will be a fan. This game will not be leaving my collection anytime soon, possibly ever, unless they come out with Shadows Over Camelot 2, Shadows in Space. I don't know. <laughs> so my name is Nick. This has been Board Game Brawl, reminding you to get out there and game every day and in every way, even if you're the stinking traitor. Take care. <laughs>